Uh, thank you all for giving your time to come uh, to listen to me uh, today, this morning, this afternoon. Um, uh, I pay my respects to the Ngunnawal people as well and their elders past and present. I, um, a bit about myself, uh, first I live in Darwin on Larrakia country. I am um, a Kororeg Aboriginal man. Kororeg are the islands closest to the mainland in the Torres Strait and I can trace my ancestry back uh, generations before Captain Cook um, sailed through there and landed on Possession Island and uh, renamed it in that way. Uh, I am also Kokogo, which is the central island group in the Torres Strait, and Erebumle, an Arab or Darnley island, is an island close to Mare in the, um, uh, up in the northeast of the Torres Strait, uh, where Koiki Mabo came from. Um, so that's who I am. I uh, come to be before you today because uh, I really believe in what we're doing here and I have an understanding of that through my own experience. I um, was a wharfie uh, and people understand the importance of this in different ways but I just want to share how I um, come to understand the great importance of this. Uh, I was a wharfie from when I was 17 years old uh, in Darwin. Uh, for 16 years I worked on the wharf. I was there in 1998 when the Patrick's dispute happened. I was 20 years old when all that went down uh, and you know on the wharf I got a real understanding of the value of unity uh, not just as something that you say in a forum like this or in a rally but something that requires that structure um, representation that you can choose and hold to account um, the ability to come together as people you know with like minds to um, have debate and discussion and then to reach consensus and go out with some coherency in, in unity uh, to achieve what your people want and it's not unique to unions. Um, you know, you've got the business council uh, for businesses, you've got um, uh, industry associations, the way nations, uh, democracies work as well. Uh, all of this is pretty uh, ordinary really uh, and normal. But uh, through the 98 dispute uh, that, that really um, showed me uh, or, or, or sent me in that direction. I became a delegate soon after 98 um, on the wharves. Uh, it was difficult in those times because a lot of the good old union guys retired. Um, and so I had the job of trying to say to guys twice my age, you know, we should stick together for better safety and, and to protect all those things that had been sacrificed, things that we take for granted as workers like smoko rooms and smoko breaks and, uh, you know, annual leave and all those types of things. Um, I uh, became an official of the union in 2010 uh, in the tradition of my union because I'd worked with guys that had taught me about the things that we'd done uh, with the strength of unity, not just for our own wages and conditions over the years, but um, to support social justice struggle. I worked with a guy named Brian Manning, who was one of the wharfies that regularly took supplies from Darwin down to the Gurindji mob when they'd walked off. Wayfield Station, and for those that don't know about that, uh, 200 Aboriginal stock workers, domestics and their families walked off Wayfield Station in 1966, initially for equal wages, um, but it became a struggle for land rights, uh, and that iconic photo of Gough Whitlam was the culmination of that, they won some land back. Um, the Gurindji people are great supporters of this campaign, I go back there every year for the anniversary of the walk-off, and they're supporters of this because they understood they understand that they want some land back, um, but they suffered from paternalism and sabotage, particularly from the Northern Territory Country Liberal Party, uh, who were in power at the time. Uh, and the, the dream to live on their land their way was denied. Um, and that was because they had some land back, but they didn't have enough say or influence over the policies and the laws about how they were able to enjoy their land and run their cattle station and their mining company. Um, the 1940s, the Pilbara strike, wharfies and seafarers refused to export cargoes, same sort of struggle um, in solidarity uh, with those pastoral station workers um, to get equal wages. Um, and so in that tradition I started to get more involved in, in my own community, organising rallies and uh, forums and things to respond to some really harmful decisions that were made. Uh, such as 2014-15, uh, Tony Abbott was the Prime Minister 
cut hundreds of millions of dollars from uh, community services, over $500 million. Some of you might remember the protests around the country around the WA community closures, you know, which was a result of that decision that the federal government made. Um, uh, the, uh, also, you know, the treatment of youth in detention at Don Dale, exposed by Four Corners, uh, deaths in custody. But organising responses to these uh, harmful decisions and injustices really opened my eyes in that time uh, between 2014 and 2017 how for everything that we were trying, our advocacy, our shaking our fist or meeting behind closed doors with ministers um, and heads of department for royal commissions, there just wasn't enough change. There weren't any repercussions for these poor decisions, um, you know, uh, politically. Uh, and so I was starting to look for how we could do things better. That led me to be involved in the process from late 2016 to 2017, that the process that led to the making of the Uluru Statement from the heart, uh, because I was looking for how we could do things more effectively. It just wasn't good enough. Um, so I'm here because after the Uluru Statement was made, or actually just before it, um, Arnie Pat Anderson, um, one of our great leaders, and Professor Megan Davis and Noel Pearson went to the MUA National Office in Sydney. I was there for the meeting. And they asked my union to lend me to the movement. Uh, I was still employed by the union. I wasn't the government or the referendum council that did this work, and I'll talk about that soon. Um, but for six years now, over six years, I have worked on this with the support of the union. I'm still an official of the union full time on this so um, because I believe in what I'm talking about here. All right, so what I'll do with this presentation is I'm going to take you through the longer history of the Uluru Statement um, and how we come to be considering a voice at this referendum as the form of recognition <coughs> we see, um, the contemporary history of the Uluru Statement, uh, and I will also then, uh, I'll get through that as quickly as possible and deep dive into the referendum itself, okay? The words, what a referendum is, uh, that sort of thing. Okay, so that's the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Uh, it's a canvas, 1.6 by 1.8 metres. Uh, it's, uh, I was entrusted with it for the first uh, almost two years of its existence to take it to the Australian people, not because I was anything special, but because I had the resources of my union to start a people's movement. Um, and uh, it is one of many statements and petitions. So let's look at the longer history here. And I'm not going to give you a, an extensive list, but I'm going to give you enough, uh, show you enough of statements and petitions that we've made to give you the pattern throughout history, the lessons that we've learned. This petition is the petition done by William Cooper and the leaders of the time. It was a petition to the king. This one here, the Yakala Bark petitions, 1963. Um, Yakala Bark petitions, the Yolnu people seeking to protect country. The federal parliament was moving to excise a massive portion of their land. They were trying to protect sacred sites and hunting grounds. But also um, one of the um, passages of words in the Yakala Bark petitions is that they feared that they would suffer the same fate of the Larrakia tribes. So they saw what had happened when there was a settlement, a city, built on the Larrakia people's land and they feared that they were wiped out and with this move to excise their land and build a big mine there that they would suffer that same fate. They took the matter to the Supreme Court in the Northern Territory. They lost that case but there, some of the decision was important, um, a precursor to the Mabo decision um, and so quite significant. This one here is the 1972 Larrakia petition to the Queen and you can see the the thumb marks, uh, thumbprints from some of our illiterate, illiterate people of the time patched together uh, petition. Um, in common for these statements and petitions is that they were all, they all called for a voice. Every one of them called for political representation. To, to go back to what I said earlier, it's natural, it's normal for large groups of people to set up a structure to speak coherently to get, you know, uh, to speak to their interests. Um, and so each of these statements and petitions were ignored by the king or the 
federal parliament or the Queen. Um, and all of them, uh, yes, yeah, so they all called for a voice and they're all dismissed and ignored. This one here is the Barunga Statement, 1988, and I separated out um, because Bob Hawke was the Prime Minister at the time. He travelled to Barunga, a small Aboriginal community near Catherine in the Northern Territory. The late great Unipingu there, who passed away recently, Gama is this weekend um, on Yolngu land. Um, the Barunga Statement again called for a voice. Um, the words are, we call on the Commonwealth Parliament to pass laws providing a national elected Aboriginal and Islander organisation to oversee Aboriginal and Islander affairs, a voice. Um, it also called for a national treaty, as did the Larrakia petition. Hawke promised both of those things. He failed to deliver on a national treaty. Um, the WA Premier Burke was particularly vehemently against it, and the politics just didn't go that way. Um, but uh, he did deliver on the voice and he established the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, or ATSI. So, this brings me to another pattern throughout history. Um, we have established many voices before without waiting for governments to do so. Um, these representative bodies up on the screen here, uh, established by our own means, the first one they say was the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association, Established in 1924, um, disappeared by 1927, uh, led by a wharfie actually, um, that's how far back the support of maritime workers go um, for Indigenous struggles, um, a Warramai man named Fred Maynard. Um, so these voices were established um, with allies as well, non-Indigenous allies, um, and they were silenced. Uh, with the powers that the authorities had over our people, tactics of intimidation. So in those days and, and beyond, the authorities could steal our children, they could direct us to work without pay, they could exile us from country and separate us from our families, decide who we could marry. Um, those powers were used to intimidate the leaders and to silence those voices. Okay. Then in more recent times, leading to ATSIC, um, there were a couple of others. Uh, the National Aboriginal Consultative Committee established under Whitlam, uh, gotten rid of under Menzies, uh, and then the National Aboriginal Conference. Um, and then a big gap in between when Hawke got rid of that one and established the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. Um, around and around we go. Um, every time we establish a representative body under one government, it's changed or removed by the next, and you're starting over again. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, um, again established by Hawke, the opposition leader at the time was John Howard. He vehemently opposed the establishment of ATSIC. Uh, when he won power in 1996, he went about fulfilling that uh, pattern throughout history. Uh, the first thing he did, ATSIC was a service provider, uh, unlike the voice that we're talking about today, I'll talk about that later. Um, and he cut the budget. And if you could think about this, you know, this history tells you quite clearly, I think, um, our people were really struggling to lift themselves out of poverty at this time. It's the first real self-determination we had of that level, um, largely uneducated, you know, much different to today. Uh, we've got many more people making it through university. Uh, but you see, when that budget was cut, there was a bit of a tactic of divide and conquer going on there. Um, the uh, being a service provider and, our, and the representatives trying to do their best to lift their communities out of poverty, what it did was it set us up to fight over what was left you know, to be able to improve our lives. Um, also, ATSIC had problems and people of a generation that were um, following politics in them days have certainly heard about those problems. Um, but you didn't hear about the good things that ATSIC was doing. It was doing a lot of good work. And so, again, a tactic was to amplify its problems and not celebrate its wins. 
Uh, and this is important to consider. All organisations have problems from time to time. A union, a council, a business, um, a government. Uh, you know, all organisations have problems. What do you do? You reform. You know, you amend the rules or the, const or the constitution of the organisation. You close loopholes that are being exploited. If it's a democracy, as ATSIC was, then let democracy run its course and choose better leaders. If people are breaking the law, if there's corruption, then the, do the law should deal with it. But you don't just get rid of an organisation. We wouldn't have a parliament if that was the case, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, that is what was at play there. Uh, we have been led to believe, and I think a, a lot of Australians still believe this, and this is one of the challenges that we have, that these were all failures. That's not true. It was a failure of government to want to be held to account to listen to Indigenous people. Um, we are human like everyone else and we are capable with training, with experience, um, with reforms, you know, to, we are capable of having a representative body that can do good like anyone else. Um, but when ATSIC was destroyed, let's think about this then. We have made great advancement when we have had a voice. When we lose a voice, things get worse. 2005, ATSIC was officially um, finished. Uh, 2007, the Northern Territory Intervention, the Northern Territory Emergency Response. For those that don't know about it, um, there are social issues in our communities that relate to poverty, um, traumas that are carried from generation to generation, and we know through science that you know it does carry from generation to generation. Um, uh, all sorts of problems, uh, like any community of human beings, you know, you get uh, greater social ills when those things are at play. But Howard, coming up to an election, is looking for his next, um, you know, political football to use, and it was Indigenous people. And um, basically uh, suspended the Racial Discrimination Act Northern Territory, announced to the nation that these problems were an Aboriginal problem that deserved um, the army being rolled into those communities to um, implement it, to um, do the intervention. And the main thing here is that we know that for hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of your taxpayer money, um, that it made things worse. Okay? And we know there were fabrication, fabrications to you know, blow it up and to be able to justify it. And we also know that there was disappointment um, when they didn't get as much of a boost in the polls as they'd hoped from doing this. Um, really a, a disgrace. But things get worse when we don't have a voice. Those funding cuts that I talked about were too easy um, to do. Uh, we have seen the gap widen. All of these are lessons that go into this um, the more contemporary history of the Uluru Statement is just prior to this in 2015, um, with the gap widening in a crisis, 39 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders called for a meeting. The Prime Minister and the Opposition Leader, it was Abbott and Shorten at the time, and they said we need to do something. They said um, two things that are important to this moment. They said, uh, firstly, when it comes to constitutional recognition, we support it. But we want more than symbolism. We want a form of recognition that is substantive. And the words used was that give us greater fairness. Secondly, they said that we understand meetings like this can happen and then nothing might follow. We seek for a referendum council to be established to be able to take the question from this meeting to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and the broader Australian public about what form of recognition we could accept. The Referendum Council was established with bipartisanship because there had been bipartisanship on constitutional recognition since Howard. Um, and uh, the Referendum Council, 50% uh, Indigenous and 50% and non-Indigenous leaders um, designed this. Arnie Pat Anderson, who I mentioned earlier, uh, was one of the co-chairs. <clears throat> These dialogues were three days each. Um, except for the Canberra one, it was one day 
Um, the dialogues had an intense lesson on civics, they were well informed, they were formulated to ensure a cross-section of views and perspectives, 100 participants at each, not to exclude anyone, but just to ensure that, that um, it wasn't just the loudest of our people that were practised at being heard, dominating the outcome. There had to be space for the quieter advocates, the healers, um, the service providers, all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I went to the Darwin one, uh, we elected delegates, I was elected, and we went to a culminating convention in the heart of the nation at Uluru in late May 2017, and that is where the Uluru Statement was made. We had three more days of passionate discussion and debate, um, 270 of us. Uh, on the final morning, 250 of us endorsed it with standing acclamation and tears of joy and hope. It was hard work, but we did it. There were naysayers saying that we couldn't um, come up with a consensus. Indigenous people can't um, agree on these things. Well, we did it. But to expect 100% of Indigenous people to support something when you're 270 of us from all around the country, you know, yeah, of course not. So 250 is a, uh, it's a massive, uh, it's, a, it's a political feat that should be celebrated. The Uluru Statement from the Heart uh, was then, uh, we all lined up and put our names around the edge here. Then these honourable women, Rini Kulitu was a lead artist, um, Maraku Arts there, Uluru in the background there. This is at um, Murujulu, uh, the Aboriginal community closest to Uluru. They painted it, and then Rachel Perkins organised for the printing in the middle, um, final. <clears throat> uh, the lessons that go into the Uluru Statement are these. Firstly, um, that if all those other statements and petitions have been dismissed and ignored by Parliament or um, kings and queens, then we address it to the Australian people as an invitation. Uh, also, we need a voice, but we must learn from that pattern throughout history um, put it out of the reach of hostile governments that always come along so that we can guarantee that we're going to have a say um, and that the only way you can do that is in the constitution, the rule book of the nation. The Australian people can put it there, the parliament can't take it away. And I'll talk about the words that do that soon. As predicted, um, the government uh, of the day dismissed the Uluru Statement um, but because it was an invitation to the people, we did the work to make it uh, uh, a topic that couldn't be ignored. Um, and now, as of May last year, we have a government that is committed to um, the Uluru Statement in full. So that means we're going to a referendum later this year, October or November. Uh, we're only around, you know, I think it's around 11 weeks now, uh, away from the, the possible date. Um, and this is urgent. So this is more than a history lesson. I'm going to ask you to take action. But let, let's make sure you understand uh, everything here. What is the Constitution? It defines the powers of our government. It's an agreement made, um, you know, in, in the late uh, negotiations in the late 19th century, established in 1901 between the colonies that became the states of our new federation. Um, it included clauses that enabled uh, Indigenous people to be specifically excluded uh, and one such place was in this, um, this section here. Uh, a lot of Australians are unaware of it, it's the race power, section 5126. Um, so we were excluded from the counting of the reckoning of the population. Um, that's something that changed in 1967. Um, this also changed in 1967. Um, the race power, just to explain it, it gives the Australian Parliament the power to make special laws for the people of any race except the Aboriginal race in the, initial, uh, in the original constitution. Um, that changed in 67. These red words, other than the Aboriginal race in any state, were removed in 1967. Um, and so then it was applied to Indigenous people as well. That didn't mean that before 67 laws couldn't be made about Indigenous people, it just meant states had that power. And Aboriginal leaders in those times, in, in the decades leading up to this, that fought for the 67 referendum, they saw it as an incremental step forward if we could transfer that power to give Indigenous affairs to the federal parliament. 
Why? Because the states were particularly cruel and negligent. And they saw it as a, 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 a step forward for the federal parliament to take that responsibility. Since 1967, the race power has been used to make laws about indigenous people. Um, in the 1990s, there was the Hindmarsh case though. Uh, so the Hindmarsh case, um, indigenous people in South Australia that were trying to protect sacred sites, argued that that power should be used for the benefit of indigenous people. Um, but the Hindmarsh case found that that power uh, it determined that that power could be used to discriminate to our detriment, not necessarily for our benefit. Okay, so one of the reasons why I go into this is so you understand how important a voice is to be able to influence the use of the race power. We don't seek to remove the race power because we might jeopardise some beneficial laws like the Native Title Act. Um, but uh, one of the uh, pieces of misinformation that is put out there by the No campaign is that 1967 removed race from our constitution and now we're all equal. Well, that's false. The race power is still in there and it's been used um, since 67 only to make special laws about Indigenous people. And it can be to our detriment. Okay. So how do we change the constitution to enshrine the voice to parliament? We need a majority of voters to agree. Uh, we also need a majority of states. And unfortunately, I'm in the Northern Territory. You guys are here. <laughs> we only count to this matter here. Okay? That doesn't mean we don't. We can't help. We've got family and friends and, and that interstate. Um, visibility is important. Lots of people come to Canberra uh, from elsewhere. Uh, and every vote counts. What is the change? I prefer to use this slide. Um, the change is this, um, when we vote yes, uh, we will see a new chapter 9 inserted into the constitution, um, recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, section 129, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice, in recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia, one, there shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Two, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice may make representations to the Parliament and the Executive Government of the Commonwealth on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And three, the Parliament shall, subject to this constitution, have power to make laws with respect to matters relating to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice, including its composition, functions, powers and procedures. So, to summarise, it's recognition through guaranteeing that there will be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice. The function of the voice is to make representations to the Parliament and Executive on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And the Parliament decides the composition, powers, functions and procedures and everything else. Okay? So subject to the Constitution. So what we are voting on is yes or no to this. Should we recognise Indigenous people for their 60,000 years of history and culture, um, to share in that, to be unique in the world in that regard, by giving them a say about matters that relate to them? Not a right to veto, not a third chamber in Parliament, representations. The Parliament decides how. That's what we're voting on. That's all the detail there. But I'll talk about the detail argument. So I'm just going to address some frequently asked questions before we have questions uh, from you guys. Um, the, the matter of detail uh, is one that has been used to try to confuse Australians. Um, as I talked about, that's what we're voting on. The principle is another way to describe it. The principle if we should recognise and listen to Indigenous people. That's because our constitution doesn't have a whole lot of detail. It's much shorter than the enterprise agreements that I've negotiated. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if the Native Title Act is this thick, you know, the constitution is this thick, right? Um, it has the high level, um, you know, laws. So tax as an example. The parliament is given the power for, to make laws for the collection of taxes. It doesn't say how much tax or where the tax commissioner, you know, how to choose a tax commissioner or where the office is. Uh, all that sort of stuff is in legislation. 
okay? And we elect parliamentarians and hold them to account to make decisions on those details because if it was in the Constitution, we'd have to have a referendum, you know, all the time. It needs to be flexible. Same with the voice. Should be recognition and a voice. How many people, where they're chosen from, what the borders of the regions are, all of those things are going to need to change and improve over time, like ATSIC should have had the opportunity to change and improve. Um, so the Parliament has that flexibility to do that. Okay? So there's a lot of dishonesty from those that understand this system that are getting out there and saying there's not enough detail. But we understand that people are interested um, and curious about how this will work. Um, so short of saying, if we were to say there will be 24 representatives and this is the border of the region for there and that sort of thing, then people are going to argue, well, it should be 26 representatives or it should be 30, you know, and that border should be shifted over here or there and everybody fights over those things instead of focusing on what the principle that we're setting up in the Constitution is. Uh, but we give um, these design principles. We negotiated this as part of the... 20 Indigenous people that negotiated it with the government, um, with eminent constitutional experts um, advising us, like Professor Anne Toomey, Professor George Williams, former Chief High Court Justice um, Robert French, uh, Kenneth Hayne, um, Professor Megan Davis, Noel Pearson, uh, Asmi uh, Wood, I think his last name. Anyway, um, the, the design principles are these. This is just some of them. There's others. I encourage you to look them up. The voice will give independent advice. Um, the voice will be accountable and transparent. It'll work alongside existing organisations and traditional structures. Um, it won't have a program delivery function like ATSIC did. We've got ARCHOs now, um, you know, Aboriginal controlled service delivery happening. So this is purely about influencing policies and laws and improving those and working with those existing organisations. It'll be chosen by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people based on the wishes of local communities, representative of our communities, um, gender balance and youth will be involved, uh, um, and it won't have a veto power. Okay? These are part of the introduction of the alteration bill, so they have some legal standing. When the referendum passes, what happens next is the government will go and have consultations, run a process with Indigenous communities, about those final details, how many, how they're elected, all those sorts of things. Then they will take it to the parliament and then the opposition and the crossbenchers and all the rest, um, they're gonna have their big debate and they'll settle on something. So another reason why we don't say 24 representatives or whatever we wanna say before the referendum is because that's not certain. Parliament needs to debate those things. Who knows how that is gonna play out? Um, so it's disingenuous of uh, Peter Dutton and them to say that they need those details now. Another commonly asked question is why don't all Indigenous people support this? That's because we're not homogenous. You know, we're human. <laughs> um, if we would, as I said before, if we were to wait for 100%, you'd never do anything. Um, and we should respect those diverse perspectives and use our own common sense and remember these two things. The Uluru Statement was the most well-informed, it was a unique process in how well-resourced and Indigenous-led it was. The form formulation of it was very important. Um, and so I believe if we were to run that process again with 10 times as much resources, uh, with 10 times as many Indigenous people involved, because you're never going to get 800,000 people involved in one process, um, we would get the same result. Even Indigenous people that are against this, if you really listen to them, they're giving you plenty of reasons to say yes to this, okay? And if you listen to people that don't know about it, which is normal again, I could find someone in Canberra, I'm sure, that doesn't know who the Premier is here, um, you know, or who their local member is, uh, or what, you know, this social pol housing policy discussion is, that's normal as well. But if you listen to them, they want to be heard. They have the solutions, they want their community to be heard. Um, but there's low levels of trust for government um, and processes, because of all the terrible things that have been done. That's one of the driving factors, um, all of those different reasons, like any other humans. Polls have shown also that over 80% of Indigenous people support this, and the sample size they say is small, but it's not if you compare it to your sampling 
from 800,000 people, not you know 16 million voters or whatever that is. All right, <clears throat> this is the campaign, Yes23. Um, there's also a kitchen tables campaign uh, conversations. Uh, I would love for you to hopefully be invigorated for this. Looks like I put people to sleep, but hopefully be invigorated <laughs> from this. Um, that you will sign up as a volunteer um, and uh, and do everything you can in this very short amount of time till till the referendum to help us to win. Thank you. Mm -hmm.